In chapter 5, we will be looking at the states of matter. You may recall from a previous chapter that the different states of matter are gas, liquids, and solids. For our first lecture here in chapter 5, we will be emphasizing the gaseous states state of matter as opposed to the liquid and solid. So what we'll cover in this lecture here is a definition of how we measure pressure and we'll define pressure and we will define determine how to measure pressure. Next we we'll look at different gas laws. You may recall from a previous chapter a law, a scientific law is um, a, a statement hypothesis that's been around and tested and, um, and, and we're using that now as part of our scientific tool. Next we look at an ideal gas law. That's a specific one that we'll emphasize. And also the law of partial pressure which is dealing with mixture of different gases. And the last part of our lecture, we'll look at the kinetic theory of gases. So notice we're applying a lot of the information that we covered in previous chapters in terms of laws and theories. For this lecture, you will definitely need your calculator and of course your periodic table, but we we will be doing a lot of, quite a bit of calculations. So get your calculators ready. Okay, let's first of all define pressure. And here we're talking about the gas pressure. Pressure is a force per unit area exerted against a surface. As you can imagine, in a gas, we have molecules. So it's molecules that are bouncing against the surface area of the container that exerts the pressure from the gas. Units or units of measurements. They're commonly measured in millimeters of mercury, and I'll explain that in a second, why mercury, or in atmospheres. A unit that's typically used also is tors. So here is a summary of the units that you'll typically see in chemistry. Atmospheres or millimeters of mercury, tors, pascal, and this is typically never used, um, inches of mercury and, and bars. So these are the ones that we will use the most in this course. Atmospheric pressure is measured using a barometer. So when you watch the news in the evening and they give you the, the pressure of the atmosphere outside, it's measured using a barometer. A manometer, on the other hand, is used to measure the pressure of a gas in a confined space. So whenever you measure the pressure in, in your tires, typically, typically that instrument is a manometer. Of course, it comes in different forms. Let us look at some of the instruments that are used. This is a bar barometer and it's basically a tall tube with a hole in it and it's filled with mercury. So here's the mercury and then inverted into a container of mercury. Based on the pressure of the atmosphere, the mercury will fall to a specific level if that level is at normal atmospheric pressure, it is typically 760 millimeters of mercury. So that's why we have millimeters of mercury. So this is the atmospheric pressure that's pushing down on the mercury and forcing it up, but it can only force it up so far based on the atmospheric pressure outside, and that's why it's measured in millimeters of mercury. Another device, let's use the manometer. So if you have a gas here, let's say the air in your tire, and you want to measure the pressure, 
here's one ancient instrument that's used the more modern instrument that are used these days but here's one you open the um, an opening for the air to come out into a tube that has mercury and based on the height of the separation that will be the pressure of the gas in the tube notice again it's measured in millimeters of mercury so that gives us an idea of the pressure so you can see in this lecture we'll be doing quite a bit of conversions from millimeters of mercury into atmospheres because um, they, these units are typically used in science. Let us look here at some laws, some gas laws. So as you can imagine as a scientist what we do is we study nature so we have um, um, a, 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 a gases for example and we're trying to understand the behavior of gases. So years ago chemists studied that and Boyle for example is one of the he, he is one of the chemists that looked at the properties and the behavior so to speak of gases and what he discovered after looking at uh, different gases and their behavior what he discovered is that a fixed mass of gas at constant temperature notice here constant temperature the volume is inversely proportional to the pressure so I want you guys to really absorb this information and, 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 and try to understand it so it's saying here that a, 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 at constant temperature a volume is inversely proportional to the pressure so just imagine a balloon here if you fill it with air so it is in a fixed volume in it's in a volume in the balloon at a constant temperature if you should increase the pressure let's say you squeeze that balloon in so the pressure would be increased and of course the volume would be decreased so once again that's an inverse proportionality if one increases the other one decreases so again for fix the volume of a balloon if you should squeeze that balloon in the volume gets smaller but the pressure of the gas increases of course if you get to the point that you squeeze it too far in it will pop primarily because the pressure has gotten so high so this is a relationship P times V is equal to a constant as you can see if one increases such as the pressure the other one has to decrease such as the volume to maintain a constant here is the equation that's of importance for Boyle's law at constant temperature P1 times V1 which means the initial conditions the initial pressure and the initial volume if you should make a change to that like squeezing the balloon in it will have a final pressure and a final volume described as P2 and V2 some books you'll see this written as P initial and V initial I and PF for final and VF for final so what's important here is can we apply this law to solving a problem so get your calculators and let's see if we can apply that so here's a question that you may get on your quiz or on your test so we have at constant temperature so now you can see this is really at Boyle's law as some the the pressure of a sample of gas which is six liters is increased from one atmosphere notice atmosphere to two atmospheres so this is the initial condition or one and this is the final pressure or two and here is the initial volume and we just need to find the final volume so get your calculators this is the equation or conversion that will be given to you now we need to 
utilize this equation to solve this problem. Okay, so pause the video and get out your calculator and do the math and you can see here that after you've done that, uh, the answer is on the next page. So let's see what's there. So it is, hopefully you got here, 3 liters. So if not, tr keep trying it until you get it. But the main thing is we are using this equation and we know what P initial is, pressure. We know what V initial is, 6 liters. We know what P final is, 2 atmospheres. And the volume is what we're trying to find. So set that equation up so you can do the calculations and you should get 3. Okay, let's see. Here's another law. We have three. Well, three initially that we'll discuss. And this is Charles' law. So what he observed is that at constant pressure, constant pressure, the volume is directly proportional to the temperature. So at constant pressure, the volume is directly proportional. Notice the term here. This is not an inverse proportionality as we had before, but a direct proportionality, which means that if one variable increases, the other one will increase. Um, as you can see here, um, V over T is equal to a constant. So if this volume increases, if this is a constant here, this will have to increase to compensate, to keep it a constant. Again, you can imagine having a balloon and you put air in this balloon. If you should take that balloon and put it in an oven, for example, you can imagine that the volume will increase. It will get larger. If you take that same balloon and put it in the freezer, where the temperature is much lower, the volume will decrease. So again, it's a direct proportionality. One thing I should point out here, the temperature is measured in kelvins. So it's, we're no longer using degrees C or degrees Fahrenheit. We're using kelvin here, so you can imagine you will have to convert from Celsius to Kelvin if you have a temperature in Celsius. So here is the expression. If you have an initial con set of conditions, such as an initial volume and an initial temperature, and here is the final, such as you're changing those conditions, here is the final volume, and here is the final temperature. Notice again, the temperature is in Kelvin. So let's see if we can apply that to solving this problem. At constant pressure, notice at constant pressure, so we know this is Charles' law. The temperature of 4 liters, so this is the volume. Notice here, liters is the volume. So you should remember the units of measurements, liters of volume. A sample is increased from 300 Ks. Notice K here is representing temperature. So that's the initial temperature and the final temperature will be 400 K. So what is the new temperature? What is the new volume, I should say? What is the new volume of the gas or the final volume of the gas? So what you need to do is to get your calculator and here is your equation. V1 would be here 4 liters. T1 would of course be 300. T2 would of course be 400. And V2 is what you're trying to solve for. So set that equation up and punch the numbers in your calculators and see what you get. The answer here is 5.3 liters. Don't forget your units. 5.33 liters. Again, notice two decimal places because we have here two decimal places for the least precise measurement. 
this number is 400 point, which means it has infinite number of zeros after that. Same here. Okay, let's look at another law, and this one is Gay-Lussac's law. I think he's a French chemist. So what he observed is that at constant volume, the pressure of a gas is directly, notice again, directly proportional to the temperature. So the pressure is directly proportional to the temperature. Which means again, using our example, you get a balloon, fill it with air. Okay, if you should increase the pressure, let's put it the other way, if you should increase the temperature, the pressure will increase. So in other words, it's not increasing the volume, so just assume that the volume is fixed, then the pressure will increase. Another good example is um, using a pressure cooker. For those of us who cook, you can purchase a pressure cooker, and what it is, it's, it's a fixed volume container. So you put your food in that volume container, and you seal it, and you turn on the heat. If it gets too hot, it will, the pressure inside will increase until it blows. So that's why we have to make sure whenever we're using a pressure cooker in the kitchen, we have to make sure that we vent it ever so often because the pressure is directly proportional to the temperature. If the temperature increases, the pressure will increase. Same thing here. The pressure increases, the temperature will increase to equal a constant, and that's direct proportionality. So here is the equation of importance. Initial condition and a final condition. So if you have a gas at initial pressure and an initial temperature, if you should change to another temperature, for example, the pressure will also change. So let's see if we can apply this concept. A sample of gas at constant volume. Notice constant volume here, which means Gay-Lussac's law. It's at one atmosphere. So that's the initial. If the temperature is increased from 300, so that's the initial temperature, to 400 K, that's the final temperature, what is the pressure. So punch these numbers into your calculator. So set up, set up your equation first and punch these numbers into your calculator and see what you get. The answer is on the next slide. So let's see what I have here. So what I get here is 1.333. Notice it's ATM as the pressure. Why? Because what's given here is ATM as the pressure. Okay, we have here a summary for the three gas laws that we looked at. So again, you need not memorize this because when you're taking the quiz or the test, you can have this as part of your cheat sheet right before you. But the main thing to remember is the names as it relates to the expression. So Boyle's law is at constant temperature. And here's the relationship. Charles's law is at constant pressure. And here's the relationship. Gay-Lussac's law is at constant volume, and here's the relationship. So again, as, course, as you know, in chemistry, we always try to remember the names of important chemists or scientists who develop these laws and theories. So try and remember those names. Okay, let us look here now at the combined gas law. So what's done here is, if we combine all three laws, Boyle's, Charles's and Gay-Lussac's, we have the combined gas law. Here it is. So to make life easier, you can just remember this combined gas law because you can use it to solve any change in conditions that's brought about by a, a, on a gas, such as the pressure change, the volume change, or the temperature change. This is the initial conditions. So you have a gas at pressure one, it's at volume one, 
and it has temperature 1. Notice again the temperature here is in Kelvin. If you should make a change to pressure 2 and volume 2 and temperature 2, this equation can be used to solve any one of these variables. Let's see if we can apply that. So, here we have a gas, 3 liters. So again, as you read your questions, you may want to just highlight the, 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 given, the given. So we have here 3 liters. Notice liters here. So this is volume at 2 atmospheres. Notice again the unit is atmosphere, so that's pressure. And calculate its volume when the pressure changes, is, well, changes to 10.5 atm. So that's pressure. So given this equation here, we, we did not give you temperature, but notice if the temperature is constant, as shown here, same temperature, temperature will cancel out as shown here. So that's why it's a combined gas law. So once you set this up, so your V1 is right here, your P1 is right here. Temperature is constant, so that falls out. Your P2 is right here. And your V2 is what you're trying to calculate. So set up your equation and do the math, and you should get 0 0.591 liters. Don't forget your units, liters. Okay. Let us look here at another law, and this is called Avogadro's law. And what it states is that equal volume, or one observation, the first observation, is that equal volumes of gas at the same temperature and pressure contain the same number of molecules. So again, as we go through this lecture, try and visualize um, the, the, the gas in reality. So just imagine here um, two balloons, so to speak. Equal volume. Make sure they're equal volume. What it's saying is, if the gas is this, if they're at the same temperature and pressure, they contain the same number of molecules. Okay, let's state it differently. So, it's down here. So, what has been done over the years is, since pressure differ from place to place, atmospheric pressure different, and temperature differs from place to place, over the years, chemists have come up with a standard temperature and pressure. So in that case, we can communicate to chemists all over the world that we did this measurement and the measurement we did it at was at standard temperature and pressure. And they all know what standard temperature and pressure is. Let's see what it is. It is actually 273K or 0 degrees Celsius. That's temperature. Standard pressure is one atmosphere. Right? So what Avogadro's law basically states is that at STP, we call it STP for standard temperature and pressure, equal volumes of a gas contain the same number of molecules. So again, imagine two balloons at standard temperature and pressure at 0 degrees C or 273K and one atmosphere, the number of molecules in balloon A is equal to the number of molecules in balloon B. Okay, let us look at this. So it also states, another observation is that one mole, of course here's a mole coming back to um, in our calculations, one mole of any gas at STP occupies 22.4 liters. Something you may want to remember. Take one mole of any gas, one mole of nitrogen, one mole of oxygen, 
one mole of, of um, hydrogen, neon, at STP, keyword here is at STP occupies 22.4 liters. Another observation is one mole of a gas, any gas, contains 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules. So again, one mole of nitrogen, one mole of hydrogen, at STP, contains 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules. At STP, 22.4 liters of a gas contains this many molecules. Okay, so again, try to absorb this and, 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 and think it through because we will be doing some calculations with these, num with these um, expressions. So let's apply this. So sample of carbon dioxide. It didn't state it, but it's carbon dioxide gas. Here is the formula. Notice it's a fixed ratio between carbon and oxygen. That's why it's a compound. Occupies 22.4 liters at STP. Keyword or key terms, STP. Which of the following statement applies? The sample contains 6.02 times 20, 10 to the 23rd atoms. Hmm. Atoms. Think about that carefully. We do not have any atoms here in CO2 as isolated. We have molecules of CO2, but not atoms of carbon and not atoms of oxygen. So I think we have a problem here. The sample contains 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of oxygen. We have, mo we have a molecule. We have molecules of CO2, but not atoms of oxygen and not atoms of carbon. Let's look at this one. The sample contains 6.02, or Avogadro's number, of molecules. That sounds like it should be reasonable. Granted, it could have gone further and said molecules of carbon dioxide and none of the above. So think the choices through carefully and make a selection. Let's see what I got. And this one here is the most reasonable because we have molecules of CO2. We do not have atoms of carbon or oxygen. We do not have atoms of oxygen, but molecules of CO2. So think through your questions carefully, analyze them carefully, and visualize them, even if you have to, and then you make a decision or conclusion. Okay, let us look here at another gas law. And this is called the ideal gas law. And this is basically derived from Avogadro's observations. So what it states here is that we're writing an equation which relates the pressure, the volume, the temperature, and also the mass of gas. Notice written we can convert it in moles and come up with this equation. So once again, so the, so the ideal gas equation relates the pressure of a gas, the volume of a gas, the moles of a gas, this is a constant, and the temperature of a gas. We say mass here because we can convert mass to moles. So you can see again, you will have to do some conversion. If given the mass of a gas, you're going to have to convert it to moles, which is represented here by N. So you convert that to moles. N is the number of moles. 
So let's define the terms again. Pressure, P, is for the pressure of a gas. Units, atmosphere. You have to be very careful here. The units must be in atmosphere. Not millimeters of mercury, not pounds per square inch, nothing else but ATM. The volume must be in liters. Liters. Not milliliters, not cubic centimeters, but in liters. N, which is right here, is the number of moles. And we know how to convert mass to moles. Temperature is in Kelvin. Keyword again, Kelvin. Not in Celsius, not in degrees Fahrenheit, but in Kelvin. R is a constant. So this is a number that you'll get from um, a table, or I'll give it to you. Okay, so it's a constant. You need not remember it, but, but it will be given to you to perform these calculations. So let us see if we can apply this. So, this one here is just defining R, to find R. So I'll just quickly summarize this. R is equal to this number, 0 0.0821 liter atmosphere divided by mole and Kelvin. So just remember that. No, you don't have to remember that. Just have it available. Have it available. So let's see if we can apply that. We have one mole of methane gas. Keyword here is gas. And notice here, one mole occupies 20 liters volume at one atmosphere pressure. What is the temperature of the gas? Of course, they said in Kelvin. So what you will need to solve this equation is this equation here, or the gas law here, and you will solve for T. So you know P, which is right here. You know V, which is right here. You know N, which is one mole. You know R, it's right here. And T is the only unknown, so we solve for T by setting up that equation. And you'll notice, and I'm encouraging you, to include your units when you ca do the calculation. You'll see that the units cancel, and you end up with the proper units for the answer, which is 244 Kelvin, K. Okay? Make sure you can do that. I think for the rest of this lecture, we just have some examples here. So, here we go again. What is the volume occupied by 8 grams? Notice this is 8 grams, not moles. But it's given that it's oxygen. So at least you know the molecular weight. So you can convert that to moles. So the question is, what is the volume occupied by 8 grams of molecular oxygen at STP? which means standard temperature, 273K, and standard pressure, one atmosphere. The basic equation that's needed is PV equals NRT, or the ideal gas law. Here's the constant. So, but you need the moles, though. So to determine the number of moles, here is what you will need. One mole is equal to the molecular weight expressed in grams. The molecule is O2. So look at your periodic table and find oxygen. You'll see that oxygen is 16 on the periodic table. That's atomic oxygen. But here is molecular oxygen, O2. So it's really 32 grams per mole. And we have 8 grams. So you need to convert that to moles using this conversion factor right here. Okay? Once you do that, plug it into this equation and use your constant and solve for volume. Here are your choices. 
so you can pause the video here and really do the calculations because the answer is on the next slide. The answer is 5.6 units liters. Make sure you include the liters. So make sure you get that as your answer after plugging in the numbers and utilizing that equation or the ideal gas law. Here's another example. 7 grams, notice again, 7 grams, not moles, of nitrogen, here's the formula, N2, at 10 degrees C. Don't let that trick you. This is degree C, so you have to convert that to Kelvin. Occupies 250 liters, that's volume. What is the pressure? So in other words, here again is your most important equation, the gas law, and you're trying to find the pressure. The volume is given right here, 2.5. N is not given, but you can calculate it because you know the mass of the sample and you know the molecular weight of N2. Looking at the periodic table, it's 14 times 228. You know R, that's a constant, always given. Careful, for this one, its temperature is given in degrees C, but you'll have to convert it to K. Here's your conversion factor. K is equal to 273 plus degrees Celsius. So once you do all of that conversion, you just have to plug it into this equation here and solve for P. So again, pause the video and do the calculations because you will see this again on the quiz and on the test this next week and see what you get. The answer is 2.32 atoms. Notice again, unit is atmosphere because we're calculating pressure. What is the pressure at the sample? So you'll see quite a bit of this. And of course, you may be wondering, wh why are we doing this? And it, it's just an exercise in really manipulating information to solve problems. Um, making sure you understand a concept, making sure you understand the gas law, and also making sure you can use it to solve a problem. To solve a problem. Okay, let us look at another concept here, and this is another law called Dalton's Law of Partial Pressure. But that basically states that the total pressure of a mixture of gases is equal to the partial pressure. So in other words, if you have a container, imagine your balloon again, and you pump helium into it, and hydrogen into it, and nitrogen into it, and oxygen into it, the final pressure that's exerted on the walls of this balloon is equal to the pressures that's exerted by each of these gases. We call that the partial pressure for each gas. So let's look at an application, and I think this will clear it up some more. To a tank containing N2, one gas, at two atmospheres, so that is the partial pressure of nitrogen. It, that tank also contains oxygen at one atmosphere, so that is the partial pressure of oxygen and an unknown quantity of CO2 is added. So we added some CO2, another gas, a third gas, until the pressure of the tank registered 4.6, which means that the pressure of the tank, the total pressure, the combined pressure is 4.6. Since it's 4.6, and the partial pressures of the contributing gases must add up to 4.6. We know that two atmosphere is coming from the nitrogen, as given here. We know that one atmosphere is coming from oxygen, as given in the above equation. Two plus one minus 4.6 is equal to the difference, and that's for carbon dioxide. 
So another way of stating it is if we see a total pressure of the tank of 4.6 atm, the contributing gases, the partial pressures of the contributed gases must equal to 4.6. So this is 2.0, 1.0, and 1.6 equals 4.6. So that's the law of partial pressures as it contributes to the total pressure of the container. Okay, lastly, let us look at the kinetic molecular theory of gases. And it's just a concept here. We're not going to use equations or apply this to solving problems. We just go understand the concept. It's called the kinetic molecular theory, or KMT. It states that gases consist of particles that are moving in space in random directions. So in other words, just imagine a container, I don't know, a balloon, for example, has a gas. It says that the particles of the gas, i.e. the molecules of the gas, are moving in random spaces. Space. In other words, it's not going in a specific direction. It's just randomly moving. The molecules are randomly moving. Gas particles have no volume. In other words, the, mo the, the molecules here, we're saying they do not have any volume. Do not have any bar. That's the particular molecule. There are no attractive forces between the gas particles. So if you have a balloon of, of um, oxygen, there's no attraction between any two oxygen molecules. The kinetic energy, you may recall the kinetic energy is the energy in motion. And as we have described, the molecules of a gas are constantly in motion. So because of this constant motion, that gives us the temperature of the gas. Because of the constant motion of the molecules, that's proportional to the temperature. So just imagine, if the, if the gas molecules start moving much faster, the temperature increases. If the molecules move much slower, the temperature will drop. Molecular collisions are elastic which basically means when they bump into, into each other, there's no effect. In other words, they're not slowed down by bumping into each other. Such as in, an ac in a car accident. If you meet in an accident and two cars collide, you physically, two cars physically stop. In the gas, the two molecules, whenever they bump into each other, they just keep moving. Molecules collide with the walls of the container and that's where we have the pressure. So the pressure for gas is determined by the molecules colliding with the walls of the container. So that's how the pressure is determined. Ideal gas. So you have seen this, the ideal gas equation. What you'll discover is that there, there are six assumptions that describe the ideal gas. It's ideal because it does not really exist. It's a theoretical model that describes gases. However, we have real gases. And here are some of the characteristics. The atoms do occupy some space. And there are forces of attraction, very f weak forces of attraction, and the real gas. But in reality, what we use is the ideal gas equation, and we imagine that the real gas is behaving as an ideal gas. So that's why we can do these calculations. So again, we are working in an environment with real gas. The equations and, and laws that have been developed are for ideal gas. We use the ideal gas equation because we're making the assumption that real gas is behaving as an ideal gas. So that's why we can do these calculations. I think this is the end of the lecture. So again, um, review the material, make sure you understand the concept. And as you can imagine, there'll be quite a few problems for you to solve. So make sure your calculators are charged and working. And um, 
and so we'll have a quiz on Thursday. I'll try to prepare another lecture for the rest of chapter 5 before then so you can read it through. So continue to study hard and get ready for the quiz next week. Okay? Bye!